three annual Shapiro lectures offer incredible opportunities to learn from renowned Jewish studies scholars. These lectures have been delivered virtually over the past two years. So we are so pleased to be returning to our in-person programming while maintaining a virtual option for those who can't be with us in person tonight. We deeply appreciate all of you who have taken the time to join us regardless of the format to hear our featured speaker, Dr. Elisheva Baumgarten. Dr. Baumgarten is the Yitzchak Becker Professor of Jewish Studies in the Department of Jewish History and Contemporary Jewry and the History Department at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She studies the social and religious history of the Jews of medieval Northern Europe. Her research focuses on the social history of the Jewish communities living in the urban centers of medieval Europe and especially on daily contacts between Jews and Christians, and it seeks to include those who did not write the sources that have reached us. We will leave aside time for questions at the end, but if you are joining us by Zoom, as most of you are, feel free to post questions in the chat box anytime throughout the lecture. We will then direct some of these questions to Dr. Baumgarten at the end of her talk. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Alisha Baumgarten. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let me start by thanking my host tonight. I want to thank uh, Sister Barbara Reed, the president, for having me here. I want to thank uh, Tzvi Novik, and especially Dr. Malika Simkovich, who reached out and invited me a few months ago. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you for making my stay here uh, so wonderful and so pleasant. Uh, so the title I chose for my talk tonight is Outsiders, Insiders, and In-Between, the Jews of Medieval Europe. And what I want to do tonight is I want to focus on the Jews of one geographic area. And focusing on them, I want to provide two examples of what I will be concentrating on most of my talk, which is the in-between. And you'll understand soon why I think this in-between is so important for the theme of our conference, um, the practice and faith, the competing identities, practice and faith in the public and private spheres. So let me start with a little bit of introduction about the community I want us to be focusing on tonight. Uh, the word Ashkenaz uh, is usually the name we use as scholars to talk about the Jews of northern France and Germany. And I'll be focusing on the High Middle Ages, so on a period from about 1200 to 1350. The beginning of the period I'll be talking about is really because of the plentifulness of sources we have from this period. So from 1200 on, we have more and more sources that tell us about the lives of medieval Jews living in the different urban spaces in this geographic area. Uh, and these urban spaces were spaces that were expanding tremendously during this period. I'll show you that in a minute on the map so you'll be able to see it yourself. The end of the period I'm talking about tonight, 1350, I think needs no explanation after two years of pandemic. After two years of pandemic, uh, we know that in 1350, medieval Europe underwent a tremendous change with the Black Death. Um, I would say that my work has been focused on the period till 1350 for many years. Actually, in light of the pandemic, I see the focus of my work changing, and I see the 14th century as a whole becoming much more central in my work with questions of what happened before the pandemic, what happened after the pandemic. Of course, I'm not talking about our pandemic. I'm talking about the medieval pandemic. And um, that's something maybe I can refer to in questions and answers a little bit later on. So if we look at the scholarship, on the people of Ashkenaz today, I would say we have different kinds of history that really relate to my title tonight, insiders, outsiders, and in between. If you look at the second bullet point here, you can see one type of history that was very, very common, certainly in the years after the Holocaust, but even well before that, and that's Lapidus history. Telling the stories of medieval Jews from attack to attack, from pogrom to pogrom, from unfortunate event to unfortunate event. So you could go from the First Crusade to the Second Crusade to different specific events in different places, expulsions from England, from France, from different places in Germany, to the Black Death, and other attacks that some people here in this room probably know very well, and others know some of these names. So that was one way of doing history. The pioneer of doing history differently was Salo Baran from Colombia, who really talked about an anti lacrimose history of Jews. And I think from the period from the 60s or the 70s on of the previous century, people started talking more and more 
about Jews who felt at home in the cities they lived in in medieval Europe. Yes, there were these horrible events before, after, and in between. But in between these events, they were very much part of their surroundings. And over the past 20 or 30 years, scholars have talked about connected histories, how to connect between the lives of the Christians and the Jews who lived together. Others have liked to use the word entanglement, how Jews and Christians were entangled in each other's lives. And here it's very important to say that medieval Jews did not live in ghettos. They lived in Jewish quarters and areas where the Jews in these different places were concentrated, but these were not ghettos. These were areas in which you had Jews and Christians living as neighbors and free to transverse the different cities and areas in which they lived, the different urban centers. So a question that's been really central in scholarship over the past years is how were Jews both integrated in the places they lived in, but also distinct? How do they preserve their distinct identity as a Jewish minority, very much in separation from their Christian neighbors? And at the same time, how were they integrated? I would say that when I began my studies 25 years ago, one of the main things scholars wanted to do was show how Jews and Christians interacted, how they weren't so separate. I'd say over the 25 years that I've been studying these communities, one of the more interesting questions has become, how did they stay distinct? And that will be part of the theme of what I talk about tonight. So my talk for tonight has three parts. Part one will be uh, outsiders. How are Jews outsiders? That will be very short, because I think that part of history is probably well known to many people in this room. The second part will be, how are they insiders? I'll talk about that a little bit more, but also pretty briefly, because that's a scholarship that's been done really well over the past decade. And what I find most interesting is how are they in between? By in between, I don't mean between insiders and outsiders. That would be very simplistic. What I want to talk about is how Jews saw themselves, how they negotiated the different challenges they had around them, the different belief systems they lived within their localities, but also their distinctiveness as a separate unit they saw as very separate from their Christian surroundings, how they negotiated these differences. And I'll be giving two examples, or two main examples in my talk, that I'll explain better as we get there. But before I go there and tell you about that, I need to tell you a little bit about the research I've been doing for the past six years, and you'll understand why, because I'm indebted to a lot of other people, and I can't introduce my work without talking about it. So a number of years ago, six now to be exact, I was fortunate enough to receive a research grant from the European Research Council, something you don't have here in the United States, and you're not allowed to participate in, but in Israel we're considered a kind of third country a uh, group that's allowed to compete for these grants, which meant I got a lovely research grant, and I was able to um, found a research group, at which time I have between seven and 10 students working with me, MAs, PhDs, and postdocs at any given time. The group is finishing this October. It has been the joy of my academic life over the past years. And our research group is called Beyond the Elite, Jewish Daily Life in Middle Europe. The Beyond the Elite part is perhaps not so important for my talk tonight, because I'll be arguing that I'm talking both about the elite and about those who are beyond the elite. I call those who are beyond the elite by that name, because it's very easy to figure out who were the elite in the different Jewish communities. We know who the rich people were from different privileges given to Jews. We know who the scholars were by the work they left behind, in Hebrew manuscripts especially. We rarely know the names of those men's wives. We don't know the names of their children unless their children succeeded in their footsteps. And we don't know the names of many, many Jews who lived within the communities, except from one place that I'll talk about a little bit later, from their tombstones. Judging by those tombstones, scholars have determined that probably around 95% of the community were not learned or wealthy men. So from that perspective, we're talking about a lot of people who made medieval Judaism what it was and whose heirs modern Jews are when they talk about founding identity and trying to understand what Judaism is all about. So that is a project, Beyond the Elite. The second subtitle 
is Jewish daily life in medieval Europe. So why is daily life so important? Often historians tell the story of the history they choose to talk about based on turning points, based on crises. What we want to do, what I want to do with you tonight is to talk about how you negotiate identity. You don't negotiate identity just based on crises. Modern anthropologists have taught us that we negotiate our identity in everyday actions, where you buy your coffee, what you have in your refrigerator, just to give two modern examples, what kind of food you eat, where you go on vacation. All of these daily questions tell people a lot about who you are. So certainly medieval Jews defined who they were when faced with crisis, when faced with ultimatums, when faced with catastrophes, just like any other person does. But they also did this on a daily basis. So we really try to look at these daily interactions. How do we do this? We do this in two ways I want to talk about. The first is, how do you talk about people who didn't leave us anything written? The way I defined the project at the outset was that all our work would be between four prisms. Every person in the community had rituals. Daily rituals, yearly rituals, celebrating holidays, celebrating Shabbatot, the Sabbath, and of course, life cycle rituals, which has been a hallmark of my work today, birth, marriage, death, the life cycle that everyone went through. We all know that those life cycle rituals are moments when you define what community you belong to, what your beliefs are, and where you think you're going. Space, we've talked about space a lot today for those people here at the conference, but the question of where did Jews spend their days? Public spaces, private spaces, can we talk about public spaces? Can we talk about private spaces? Were there spaces that were only Jewish? I'll tell you my answer right away. Very few, almost not at all. But trying to figure out where Jews were in space. Objects. Every single medieval person used objects every day, just like we use objects every day. If I asked us what defines us as people today, what object, I think we'd all have the same answer, probably on silent right now while I'm speaking, right? <laughs> but most of us wouldn't like to be defined by our cell phones, right? We just replace it when it's old, it doesn't work anymore, etc. But we can talk about medieval Jews and their neighbors, the medieval Christian neighbors, thinking about objects. And even if you were not part of the elite, you used objects. So we look at objects a lot. And finally, people. Who are the members of the community? You're all Americans here, so maybe I can use this joke that my Israeli students never get. But for me, this is kind of like Mr. Rogers' neighborhoods, right? Who are the people in your neighborhood? They're the people that you meet when you're walking down the street. They're the people that you meet each day. Maybe people in the room are old enough to remember what for me was childhood TV when I was still growing up in the United States. So I wanted to get a better idea of who were the people, besides the rabbis, besides maybe the person who the king or the ruler or the bishop spoke to when they had to speak. So this is the four prisms, and they all interact all the time. I don't mean to say one, two, three, four. I mean to say, how do these crisscross in every way possible? The second thing we try to do in my research group, and this is really why you need more than one person, is not to work only with one genre of sources. One genre of sources tells you one kind of story. For example, this morning we heard about Dominicans' records when they traveled. But that, of course, is a specific genre of travel records. I'm using that example for those people in the room who heard it this morning. But what if we heard that same story from the point of view of the, of the person who the Dominican visited? Of course, we hear something different. So one of our goals in the project is to try to approach any topic we talk about from a perspective of as many sources as possible. I don't need to privilege any kind of source here in this slide, just to say, look at how many different sources we can use in how many different languages. Hebrew, medieval German, medieval French, Latin, Aramaic, and other languages that were spoken, Arabic that were spoken at that period, in order to try to figure out the medieval past. So I hope you'll understand how this works while I speak tonight, and I just want to give credit to my team this is a picture from one of our trips. We went to Germany together. And as a result of this trip to Germany, we published a volume on space. Because being in Germany, in the places that medieval Jews walked around in, really gave us a feeling of what the space did when we understood. I'm going to talk about that later. Um, so I just want to give them credit. And I'll be mentioning my students and crediting them for their work as I speak. 
Tonight you're hearing work in progress. So two new texts I am working on. That's my own personal work. I'm happy to answer questions about how you run a lab-like research team, but really just a research team in humanities where we don't take credit for each other's work. Everybody does their own work in the humanities. So you'll hear a little bit about that. And that's why I really want to mention my team now before I begin to speak. OK, so now I'm ready to start with my 10-minute introduction. So thank you for listening to the introduction. And now I'm ready to start talking about outsiders, insiders, and in between. So outsiders. Like I said, this is going to be very short. Jews were the ultimate other in medieval Europe. They were not Christians. Christian were the majority religion. In any given place, Jews were at most a tenth of the population, and even that is a lot. They came into contact with rulers who were Christian and saw their ruling power as part of their religion. And Jews were the ones who had not seen the light, who were supposed to be converted. This is the well-known slide of the synagogue and ecclesia. I think everyone in this room is familiar with this. I don't need to explain it. But the idea that the Jews were blinded, the synagogue here was blinded. They are the ones who should see the light. And they are the ones who, as the Middle Ages go on and on, are, they try to convert even more. At the same time, if we look at these maps, and you don't need to see the map, all you need to see is the dots. This is a map, as you can see, from about the year 1000, of the area in which many, many Jews settled, the Rhineland area, Speyer, Worms, and Mainz. Those big the black dots you see there, that's where there are Jews around the year 1000. This is a map from 1300, including all the expulsions of the 14th century and all the attacks. The attacks emphasize the outsider point I'm trying to make right now, that the Jews were outsiders and they were liable to be expelled, attacked, accused. We heard about blood libel accusations today in one of the talks in many different ways. But I want you to notice something else. Look how many more places there are that Jews are living in. How many Jewish settlements grew during this period? How many Jews there were in this area? In order to be able to attack so many Jews, to expel so many Jews, I'm talking about terrible things, you have to have them there. During the 12th and 13th century, medieval Europe was a culture of plenty. Urban spaces grew and flourished. Think of the city of Paris that expanded, expanded from the late 12th century to 1400 by hundreds of thousands of people. We're talking about tremendous growth, and the Jews were a central part of that growth. And that means it's time to talk about insiders. Jews were part of the cities they lived in. They were admitted to those cities. They were given privileges. They were invited, in some cases, to settle. In almost any Jewish map you look at, you'll see that the Jews lived very close to the local cathedral until they were moved in the 15th century. In order to do everyday business with authority, you had to pass through the Jewish quarter. Jews were on the central trade routes. They were allowed to do business at the fairs, in local markets, not just money lending. That's a myth. They had many, many professions. One of my postdocs, Dr. Andreas Leonard, in his current postdoc project is collecting different Jewish professions. He's found hundreds of professions. My favorite, the Jewish man who made mouse traps. Mice traps, I guess. Mouse traps? Mice traps? I guess I've been out of America for too many years. Uh, mouse traps, right? That's proper English. So that is my favorite profession. But there were many other Jewish professionals who did had other um, mekiv, other crafts that they were in charge of. So uh, looking at Jews on the ground every day, they were insiders. Just to give two examples from work my students are doing, one of my students, Nurit Dermer, a PhD candidate, is working on northern France during the period between expulsions. And you can see two examples here on the screen. I know it's small, but one is the tax list from the city of Paris from 1292. The tax collectors in Paris went house to house and wrote down how much tax they were taking from each person. And at the end of the list, we have a list that says, Ce sont les Juifs de Ville de Paris. These are the Jews of the city of Paris. They go back to those same neighborhoods where Jews live, and they go from Jewish house to Jewish house and write down the taxes. We're starting to feel the in-between. They're part of the local tax list, but they're a second, separate part of the list. By 1306, when the Jews are expelled, they won't be on the list anymore. So we brought back in, 
kicked out again in 1322, brought back in, kicked out again in 1394, but they won't be part of the local list because they'll already be somewhat separate. Another student of mine, Aviad Daron, is very, very interested in Jews and their transactions in the market. How do Jews and Christians trust each other? What are they willing to risk? She's done over close to 10,000 court records from the city of Frankfurt in the late 13th, early 14th century, showing how Jews do business with their neighbors. So you can see here how they're part of the local economic system. So those are just two really brief examples, just to give us an idea of the outsiders and the insiders. And now I want to talk about the in-between. So one way to talk about in-between is the way I in progress. Is the way I just did now. The way I just did it now was saying, look at how Jews move between Jewish space and Christian space, interacted with Christians. But that actually isn't what I mean for tonight. One of the things that scholars have shown over the past years, and I think the most important scholar who's done this is Professor Ivan Marcus, who also is one of the people I consider as a mentor, so I'm very proud to mention his work here tonight. Ivan has shown how Jews incorporated ideas from the surroundings. So being insiders didn't just mean they lived in the cities, they did business in the cities. What being insiders meant was they also spoke to their neighbors, heard about their ideas, incorporated their ideas in internal Jewish rituals. Ivan's work has centered a lot on um, the Torah initiation ceremony. That's what he wrote about in his book. I've done some of that work on the circumcision ceremony. Just to give you an example, medieval Christians always had their baptisms in church. The Jews of medieval Ashkenaz of Northern Europe moved their circumcision ceremony to the synagogue as part of taking in ideas from their surroundings. I even called this inward acculturation. I guess 20 years later, I called this appropriation because it's not just that you inwardly acculturate ideas from your surroundings, you appropriate those ideas and you make them Jewish. So the question I wanna ask really is, how comfortable were Jews appropriating of Christian ideas and how did they make ideas Jewish? How blatant was their borrowing? To what extent were they willing to take ideas, beliefs, practices from their surroundings and make those surroundings part of Jewish culture to the extent that today looking at some of these things, we might think that this was something Jews always did. So I have two examples for tonight. One example is death and cemeteries. Why do I think this is a good example? I think this is a good example because death is when Jews go to be in the Garden of Eden with Jews and Christians believe that they go to be in heaven with Christians. And any medieval Jew or medieval Christian you stopped on the street would all agree. When they go to that place there, the Jews will be with the Jews and the Christians will be with the Christians and there won't be any kind of crisscrossing between them. So Jews would agree that this was really a place where, I'm sorry, Jews and Christians would agree this would really be a place where they were separated. The Jewish cemetery was also only for Jews. So it seems to be a very Jewish space. That's what I'm going to talk about. I talk about in between this very Jewish space is the public space. My other example is much more domestic because I wanted to hit the public and the private. And I'm going to talk about medicine. Medicine is usually administered at home. Medicine is perhaps the opposite of the death because all scholars would agree that Jews borrowed from Christians, spoke to Christians, were doctors for Christians and Christians were doctors for Jews and exchanged medical advice throughout the Middle Ages. So it's almost the opposite kind of example as far as letting the Christian world into the Jewish world and having the worlds mixed with each other. However, note how interesting what I just said was that happens at home. So we have a public space that seems to be very separate and a private space that seems to be very incorporated, entangled, uh, integrated, whatever word you want to use. So let's start. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to work to computer. So here you have my medicine up on the screen. I just spoke about that, so I apologize. So let's just start with the cemetery. The first thing I would say about the cemeteries is usually they were part of the negotiation with the powers that be where Jews would be buried. What you have here is the charter of Rudiger and Speyer from 1084. And he invites the Jews to live in Speyer when he's making Speyer into a much more respectable place. 
And if you look at the words I underlined, or I bolded, besides this, I have given them the land of the church for a cemetery with rights of inheritance. So he knew if he wanted Jews to live in his town, he had to have a place for them to bury their dead. Here you can see a map of the city of Worms. To make a different point I wanted to make. The circle you see up there in the corner is where the Jews lived. That's the Jewish quarter. You can see it right there next to the main entrances into the city for any of you who are following the roads. But the cemetery was always outside the city. That meant that when someone died, you had to carry their body from their home in the Jewish quarter outside, to the, outside of the city, through the city and outside the walls. So death was not so internal, not so inside the community if you had to pass through the entire city on your way to get there. But once you made it to the cemetery, you were in a holy Jewish space. Uh, Jewish tombstones were written in Hebrew and they were internal communiques between people in the community, between the dead and the living. Now, medieval Jews would go to the cemetery very, very often. They went there often on holiday eves. They went there when someone who died, they were commemorating their death, a year after their death, a month after their death. They went there on new moons once a month. Medieval Jews were constantly in the cemetery. Just to give you an example of one beautiful ritual, on the eve of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, all the Jewish women would gather and go down to the cemetery and close to the spirits of the dead, they would prepare wicks for the synagogue in order to light up the synagogue during the year. Once again, I'm trying to give you the feeling of how internal, how inherently Jewish this space was for Jewish purposes. I'm gonna skip this slide now. A lot of work has been done over the past years though that have discussed different customs related to the dead and to commemorating the dead and the way Jews adapted ideas from their surroundings. So the first article I listed here is that of David Chayavik of, of Chicago. He works at Northwestern University. Professor Chayavik teaches at Northwestern University. In his article, he discusses how Kaddish, the prayer Jews traditionally say for the dead, became a thing for the dead in the Middle Ages. And he suggests, like other scholars before him have, that this was because Christians were saying masses for the dead. And that's why Jews felt the need to pray for their dead. If I asked any modern Jew, and probably any modern person who knows something about Judaism today, what is Jewish, they would say Kaddish. Yes, it's a Hebrew, it's an Aramaic prayer that has its roots in Jewish tradition. But it's probably because of the integration within Christian surroundings that Jews started saying this. And from there, it spread to all Jews all over the world. So that's a really fascinating example. Two other colleagues of mine, Lutzia Raspe and Frank Shalom Steiner, have spoken and written a lot about what distinguishes between Jewish customs for the dead and Christian customs. One of the things they've noted in their work is that whereas Christians pray to the dead, Jews don't. In a very, very interesting, um, in a very, very interesting responsa written in the 13th century, one rabbi named Rabbi Chaim Paltiel criticizes people who are beyond the elite, people who are not knowledgeable. He says women and men who don't know like women. And what this rabbi criticizes them for, I'm sorry, criticizes them for doing is going to graves and praying to the dead. And he says, these people do not know what they're doing. You can go and pray in a cemetery, but you should only be praying close to the dead. You shouldn't be praying to the dead themselves. And both Raspe and Shalom Steiner wrote a great length, and I love their work and respect it tremendously, about how Jews did not pray to the dead, but they prayed next to the dead. A few years ago, I was going through a manuscript at the National Library in France, and I discovered in this book on the last page, written in a kind of sketchy handwriting, this prayer. And this is the prayer I found. May it be before God, the King of Kings, that you will have mercy on Israel and on me and give me a good life and forgive my sins in this world and a good part in Eden because of the merit of the righteous person buried here. And make me rejoice when the Messiah comes and the souls of the dead are restored 
because of the merit of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, save me from all trouble. And because of the merit of Moses, David, and Rabbi Akiva and his friends, don't reject my plea. And because of the merit of all the dead and the holy, hear my prayers on this grave, like you heard the prayers of our fathers on the Red Sea with mercy. Blessed are you, God, who hears prayers. Now, I don't know what your response is to this prayer, but when I read this prayer, I was really surprised. This is almost praying to the dead. If you want to be really, really, really nitpicky, you might say they're still praying next to the dead in the cemetery, but this is very close to praying for the dead, to the, to the dead. Exactly what that rabbi was complaining that those people are doing all the time and they don't know what they're doing. So this got me really interested. This also rang very neutral or almost Christian to me. There's nothing, I mean, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, who's, who's a Mishnaic, he is here. Everything else are biblical figures, right? We don't have anything that's not a biblical figure. And since Tzvi Novik is here, I'm a little bit embarrassed to talk about this because this is his field, but this is like the prayers from the period he works on where we have Jews and Christians parallelly praying to Moses, praying to Aaron, praying to so-and-so, whoever it is, so they will save them. And later, of course, in Christian litanies, we know this very well, that you pray to the different saints and you pray to the different figures from the New Testament. So this is my example from Beth, already starting to hint that in between we have Jews borrowing a Christian practice and adapting it to Jewish terms, Jewish ideas. So that was my first example. Now I want to go to medicine. Medicine is really tricky because medieval medicine was both religious and medical. On the one hand, people know the materia medica. We know what different plants can do. We have these traditions passed on from person to person, from doctor to doctor. Um, this manuscript that you can see here on your screen is a manuscript I worked on many, many years ago in which midwives tell a circumciser what medicines they use for women giving birth. When I first found this, mid, this manuscript, which one 19th century German Jewish scholar wrote was Narischkeit, exactly those words, which means basically nonsense. Um, and why did he say it was nonsense? Because there wasn't a single rabbi mentioned in those three pages of the manuscript. And all the words were in German because every herb mentioned here is mentioned in its German name. So things like that are shared by Jews and Christians. Jews use the same methods their surroundings use. However, often you would take a red stone and put it on the belly of the woman who's having trouble in labor. Christians would recite verses from the New Testament about how Jesus ran to Egypt really, really quickly or fled to wherever it was he was fleeing or his family. And Jews would talk about Moses and the people of Israel fleeing Egypt really, really quickly. So it was the same stone, the same materia medica, but they were using different verses, each from their own tradition, in order to make this materia medica work. So that's an interesting way of being in between, right? You believe in the same substances, but you use them in different ways. This story that you see here is a very, very famous story from Sefer Hasidim, um, the Book of the Pious, written in late 12th or early 13th century Regensburg. That was for you, Sophia, because you work on that city so much. And this story tells about a Jewish woman whose son became ill. A Gentile woman came to her and said, give your son a drink, pour it over the stone, and he will be cured. Standard medieval medical procedure. You take a stone, you pour some wine, some vinegar, some water, whatever it is you pour over that stone, and then you drink from that liquid. You're basically making a potion. The Jews said, I just want you to notice these neighbors are talking about a very everyday matter, a child being sick. They live next door to each other. They share this information all the time. This is the insiders, right? The Jewess said, what are the qualities of this stone? So what kind of stone are you giving me? The Gentile woman said that the stone was brought from the grave and it is from the stone that Jesus was defiled with. And a few Gentiles were given it to drink and they were cured. Please forgive the anti-Christianity you see here in this text, right? Calling it a stone that Jesus was defiled with. That's the way Jew Jews kind of try to repel Christian sanctity. What we have here is a relic. It's a relic written, brought from the Holy Land, from the grave of Jesus, and people are using it to cure other people 
as something they use in water and wine, etc. as I said. The Jewess said, since she said that it belonged to Jesus, I do not wish that my son will drink from it. And she did not want to make any cure out of this stone. And this is with all your soul, love the Lord your God. So they quote from the Shema, from the most basic prayer of Judaism to say, this is how you believe in the Lord with all your soul. You could read this as a typical anti-Christian medieval text. There were polemics between Jews and Christians, the same way Christians talked against Jews, Jews talked against Christians, but that would be missing the point. The Jewess doesn't say it won't work. She says, I won't use it. That's a very complicated kind of in-between. She's not saying, this won't help my son forget it. She's saying, I won't use it because I'm a good Jew. I am defining myself differently. But she believes that it could work as well. That shows you how integrated she is in Christian culture at the time. But if that was all I had to tell you, that would be old news. It wouldn't be very interesting for my talk tonight. My student, Amit Shafran, worked on this very small personal notebook that belonged to a 13th century rabbi named Rabbi Isaac ben Isaac of Shinon. This was her MA work. Isaac ben Isaac wrote regular prayers in this book, but he also had all kinds of formula, cute formula. If I have time later, I'll show you a formula to know if you married the right person for anybody who's wondering about that. But among the different formula that he had, he had one text that was written in Hebrew letters, but it actually is French. So what you see here on this screen right now is the Hebrew, those of you who read Hebrew will see you don't understand any of the words except for refuah lema, the first two words. After that, it's all in Old French. Now, since I don't expect all of you to know Old French either, although I assume many of you can read the French, we're going to look at it in English, okay? So we'll look at the prayer in English. So this is what the prayer said. For good health, I conjure you, bon malon, or fever, or carbuncle, or how we'll translate it, by the Lord God, who neither should nor does disappoint, who neither sleeps nor slumbers. I conjure you by God, the mighty king, since you are here, that you no longer progress. I conjure you by God, the great, since you are here, not to profit anymore. I conjure you by, oh, I'm sorry. I conjure you by the living God, I'm sorry, I conjure you by God who is in heaven, since you are here not to remain in my body anymore. I conjure you by the living God, since you are here not to withdraw like the famous tide of the sea, abandoning your misery behind you and not letting your evil remain, to no longer wrench his gut or infect his flesh. I conjure you by the Lord God, take away your cruelty, and by bread and salt, by wine and water, and by all that God has created. I conjure you with the living God, and by the true health who inspires the doctor, and by bread and wine, and by all that God created, not to stay here. I conjure you by all the prayers that exist and have ever existed. I conjure you with all the prayers that have been and all those that will see the day, light of day. I conjure you by all the holy men who ever came into the world and by Abraham, the great man, who was ready to sacrifice his son for the love of God and to make him suffer martyrdom and actually heal in the same way. One that God restored to the prophetess Miriam after she had leprosy and actually healed. Drive out this evil from here and leave this pain. So be it to all eternity. I'm just going back a moment. I'm reminding you this prayer was in Hebrew, written in Hebrew letters, in a rabbi, a great Josephus personal notebook. My student wrote a beautiful, she did a beautiful job of analyzing this, talking about the different components of it, everything that was mentioned here. But while she was working on her MA, she now works for a high-tech company, I kept on saying to her, this is not a Jewish prayer. This is a medieval Jew adapting a prayer from something they had in their surroundings. And she kept saying to me, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And unfortunately, she didn't find it. Right after she finished her MA and submitted it, I was preparing a class on medieval medicine. And I was flipping through a book of medieval medical texts. And you won't be surprised to hear that I found something. So what is that something that I found? What I found is a mass that was said, and we know it from sixth century manuscripts and on, in honor of Saint Sigismund, who was a sixth century king who then became canonized and a saint. And Gregory of Tours tells us whenever people suffering from chills piously celebrate a mass in his honor and make an offering to God for their king's repose, 
immediately their tremor seized, the fevers disappear, and they are restored to their earlier health. So here we know what this mass is, this mass in honor of Saint Sigismund. But what did people actually say? I'm just going to read a little bit of it and you'll be able to hear it. So it goes like this, I'm sorry. Every day for three days, read this three times over the fever sufferer and he will be healed. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Behold the cross of the triune Lord. Christ was born on Bon John. Christ suffered, Don Ron Con. Christ rose from the dead, Ton Son Yon. When the Lord Jesus entered the house of Simon Peter, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying ill with fever and standing over her, he commanded the fever. Many of you here in this audience know these verses and these references better than most medieval Jews. The prayer continues. For the commemoration of Saint Sigismund, King, through your servant, Lord God, in the name of the Father, I speak to you, O fevers. In the name of the Son, I speak against you. In the name of the Holy Spirit, I conjure you, O fevers. I conjure you and join issue with you by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Is this starting to sound familiar? All these conjurations we just saw a moment ago? This is the fascinating in between from my perspective. We saw that in the Jewish prayer, we have no fathers, we have no sons, we have no Holy Spirit. Uh, we also do not have the ending. In the memory of the Holy King, Sigismund, Lord God, free your servant, and in the name of the Father, I say to you, fevers, in the name of the Son, I contradict you, in the name of the Holy Spirit, I conjure you. But if we cut out the fathers, the sons, and the spirits, we had the same prayer just a few moments ago in French and Hebrew letters. What did they put into it? They put into it Isaac and the sacrifice of Isaac. They put into it the prophetess Miriam, the typical case of healing for medieval Jews. But Jews felt very comfortable adapting and adopting, appropriating this mass said for Saint Sigismund. They felt very comfortable doing that and substituting their own names, their own words. This to me is in between. This is what it means to be an evil Jew living in Christian environments, knowing that you're an outsider. You don't believe in the same things. You don't hold by the same beliefs, but you're part of the surrounding. You have many of the same value systems. You have many of the same basic beliefs in nature, in surroundings. And if your kid is sick and burning up with fever and you know that it works, you might not use that relic from Jesus' grave, but you will use a prayer, changing the prayer to suit your needs. I think that that is what is most fascinating for me in this topic we've been talking about today at the conference tomorrow, competing identities. How do you remain distinctively you? How are you part of your surroundings? What kind of conscious and sometimes unconscious changes do you make to the culture around you? And there is an assumption in what I'm saying right now that Jews are adapting more from Christians than Christians are from Jews because Jews are a minority culture among a majority of Christians. But I think this prayer I just brought now is also a beautiful example of how majority culture can learn something from Jewish studies. Because we have that mass in different manuscripts from the sixth, seventh, eighth century, but nobody really knows how it develops this mass in honor of Saint Sigismund. And I've done a lot of research over the past weeks trying to catch up on people who have written on it, the main person being Frederick Paxton, but he really stays in kind of the early Middle Ages. He doesn't get to the high Middle Ages. By following this medieval prayer in Hebrew or in French and Hebrew letters and Hebraico French, we might be learning something about what his Christian neighbors are doing as well. So I think that is really, really interesting. I want to end here with one last thing. So the last thing I want to say is that a lot of the work I've been doing over the past years, and as you can see, my students, who I'm very proud of, so I'm always happy to talk about their work, have been doing over the past years is trying to figure out these daily dynamics and how they work. But about two years ago, we decided to do something very special together. And we decided 
that we shouldn't just be working with scholarly audiences. And here I want to just tie what I'm talking about now in the medieval reality to this place, to the Catholic Theological Union, and to this conference that is so beautifully brought together people who do ancient history, medieval history, and modern theology. We've heard quite a bit of that today here together. And we decided to create an exhibit, um, to create an exhibit that we called In and Out, Between and Beyond. I actually think my title for tonight was better. So I think Insiders, Outsiders, In Between is better than the name we thought of for our exhibit when we created it. We decided to create an exhibit by which we each wrote about a different primary source from the medieval period. And then uh, we met with seven Israeli contemporary artists. And we had those artists try to create art from our um, academic writing. Malka has a copy of the catalog there. So you can all have a look at it afterwards, those of you who are here. And those who aren't, if you go to the website, Beyond the Elite at the University of Jerusalem, you can download the entire catalog for free and have a look at it. And for my last two minutes, I'm just going to, um, one second, that's not good. I have to share the screen right and go like this. I'm sorry for the Zoom. Okay, we're okay. Um, we also have an exhibit that we created at the Hebrew University and we have a virtual exhibit. So you can actually go into the exhibit and see the space. I'll just give you one example to show it to you. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see this. So you can see here the in-between, the marketplace with all the different figures who do uh, business together. And these pictures on the walls are all pictures of the sources we worked on that a calligrapher who's very talented drew for us to try to express what they felt like when we explained to him the medieval space. What's most beautiful about this space is that we have church bells ringing on the hour. So you feel like you're walking around a medieval city. We have songs that Jews sang to Christian tunes being sung in Hebrew to the Christian tunes performed by uh, medieval vocal groups that have taken medieval notes of songs that we know and sung Hebrew songs that we know were sung to them to those tunes. And if you just look here at the very, very end, because I talked about death, I will go to the death part. You can see that here we tried to create an exhibit of what it meant to die in the Middle Ages, what objects people used when they were dying. And Andy Arnowitz, the artist, she tried to create something that looked like um, tombstones uh, to give us that feeling so we can discuss all these different things. So I'm not going to do a tour of the exhibit now. If you look online, you can find me doing tours of the exhibit in which I teach the sources and then I go through the exhibit piece by piece, one by one. Um, but this was really our attempt to get beyond the elite to the lives of the people and to really try to feel the inside, the outside and the in-between walking around this medieval space, which is really a medieval city. And um, I think that for us, the success of this was number one, we don't have the name of a single known person in the exhibit. So really to say these are the 95% of the medieval Jews whose names we don't know, but this might be what their lives were like. And number two, and that's what I'll finish with, is that this exhibit is all ready made. You can reprint it any place in the world. No insurance needed. It's all 3D printing, stickers, whatever it may be on the walls. And in October, it's opening in Germany, in medieval airports, in the space of the medieval synagogue there, where they have the actual artifacts. And from airport, we hope it will go elsewhere in the world. Our curator, who was a member of my team, is adapting it to the different places. So I hope in my talk tonight, I've managed to give you a sense of insiders outsiders, and especially of the complexity of the in-between. Thank you very much.